Welcome to the New Books Network. Good morning. Thank you for joining me for another exciting episode of New Book Network African American Studies Podcast. I am your host, Katrina Anderson. Today, I am joined by Dr. Nicholas Radburn, who is a historian of the Atlantic world, who focuses on the transatlantic slave trade. Dr. Radburn is also a senior lecturer in the history of the Atlantic world at Lancaster University. University, excuse me. He also has three major digital humanities projects. He is co-editor of the AHRC and the NEH-funded project Slave Forges, which is a digital memorial to the 12.5 million Africans who were forcibly transported through the slave trade. He is the principal investigator on the AHRC and the NEH funded toward a digital archive of the Atlantic slave trade, unlocking the records of the South Sea Company. He is also co-investigator of the AHRSD funded legacies of the British slave trade project. He has also developed models for two French slave ships that have been used in museums and classrooms around the world. Dr. Radburn, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Katrina. So today we are going to be talking about your magnificent book, Traders and Men. Can you tell us a little bit about the book? Absolutely. So this book is really motivated by a single simple question, and that is, why did Britain's slave trade, which is uh, small in scope and scale before 1700, explode in size to become the largest in the Atlantic world by the mid-18th century? And I answer that question by looking at the people who drove the trade expansion, the so-called traders and men. And those are the thousands of merchants who are in Britain, Africa, and the Americas who enslave people. And I also answer that question by looking at the, the consequences of the trade transformation for its millions of enslaved victims. Now, how did you become interested in the topic and what made you decide to write about it? Well, I started this research uh, a very long time ago, back in 2007, when I was still a MA student in New Zealand, where I used to live. And I was scratching around for a, a research topic, as, as master students do, and I lighted on the fact that where I was in New Zealand, I was able to access the business records of a Liverpool slave trader named William Davenport. And this was a man who'd outfitted over 100 slave ships, and in doing so, had made his fortune. So I investigated his, uh, his business, um, I, I, I sort of explored how he operated, the consequences for his victims, how he made his money, and that really got me interested in, in these slave trading merchants. And, and, and so I followed on from researching him to look at other slave traders elsewhere in the Atlantic, in Africa, and then in uh, the Americas, especially South Carolina and, um, and Jamaica. And each time I was motivated by the same questions, which were, who were they? Uh, why did they become slave traders? Why did they act in these uh, horribly violent ways and in this horribly violent business? And, and, and what were the consequences for both themselves and the people they enslaved? Uh, and so that's really what's motivated me throughout my research career, and that's really what's on the backbone uh, that drove me to write this book. Now, how challenging was the research process for this project, and what type of sources do you use? Well, as you might expect for a book that's written about slave traders, a lot of the sources are the slave trader themselves, um, business papers, their accounts. These were people who were, and this is obviously disagreeable to us, but businessmen and, and people who were engaged in a business that was at the time lit, sanctioned in law, legal, and therefore they, just like other businessmen, they, they created accounts to monitor their business, they wrote letters about it, and, and some of those, not all, but some, are preserved. So I accessed those in uh, principally in London, but also, as I say, some were now digitized online. Uh, and then others I accessed in places like the Clements Library in Michigan. So I had to do a bit of travel, but a lot of the records are really concentrated here in Britain or, or available uh, digitally. Uh, but that doesn't really give you the whole story, especially if you want to go beyond the sort of polite formulations that these people use in their letters and accounts to obscure what they do and to reduce what they do into sort of bare numbers and statistics. So a lot of the sources I looked at too were accounts of abolitionists, 
were attacking the trade, witnesses of people giving witness statements to Parliament, abolitionist um, hearings on what they saw in the trade, slave narratives, uh, diaries of people who were engaged in slave trading or were, or were observing slave trading. So pretty much any source that I could obtain that gave me insights onto how the slave trade worked the, and the people involved in it, both the enslaved and their enslavers. Now, was there anything that surprised you or that you learned while you were researching? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that really surprised me was the sort of shared mindset and the worldview of these people who are engaged in the slave trade. We would like to think that slave traders given that their business basically revolved around capturing people, forcing them aboard slave ships in the most horrid fashion. I'm sure we'll talk about that. Buying and selling them, separating them from their families, beating them, torturing them, all the horrors you would expect of slavery. We would expect those people to be sort of self-reflective about that, perhaps have guilt, perhaps give thoughts on it, agonize about it in their diaries or their letters. But I really didn't see pretty much any of that. And I think that really indicates what we see here are people who are comfortable in what they do, view it as legitimate, and, and have very few moral compunctions about it. And that was really bracing to see, especially when you see the kind of acts that are, you know, the sort of actions that they're, they're carrying out on the enslaved and their victims. Wow. And so now I want to dive into the book to talk a little bit about who were these traders of men that you mentioned in the title? Who were they? Well, the first thing to know is there are a lot of them. Uh, so the slave trade is, by the mid to late 18th century, enormous. And we're only talking here about Britain, let alone France, Portugal, America, Holland, all the others. It's, if we just confine ourselves to Britain, it's a trade in which uh, across the 18th century, about two and a half million people will be enslaved and, and something like 11 or 12,000, about 10,000 ships will be go across the ocean. And so for that, trade to be sustained at that kind of level, you're talking about a huge number of people who have to be invested in it as merchants and engaged in it. So in Britain, there are maybe something like 5,000 people who outfit slave ships that we know about. In each African port where people are being sold from, and keep in mind there are several hundred ports who are engaged in the slave trade during the 18th century, there might be two or 300 merchants in any particular year. And likewise, in the Americas, there's a huge number of merchants who are, who are selling the captives when they arrive off of the ships. So we're talking about a trade that probably entails something around, and this is just the people who literally bought and sold captives from the ships or transported across the ocean. I'm not talking here about the other slave traders who were elsewhere in the Americas or in Africa. At least 10,000, possibly somewhere like 20,000 people, possibly even more. So you might think, well, they're enormously numerous, diverse, given that they're in Africa, the Americas, in Britain. Uh, and it's very diff they speak different languages, of course. They have different religions. They have different backgrounds, um, sort of ethnically, culturally, different races, of course. The African slave traders are black. The European and American slave traders tend to be white. Uh, they were, they were, it would be impossible to make any generalizations. But that's actually not the case. And that was one thing that really struck me in researching them. Uh, they tend to share a very similar social background. They tend to be from a sort of middling social background, middle lowing. So we're hearing low, so Britain, they tend to be with some sort of brewers and farmers and that kind of thing. Uh, in Africa, they tend to be people who aren't in the major ports engaged in Atlantic trade until the slave trade takes off. Uh, in America, they tend to be sort of small colonial merchants or migrants. And migration is actually a big part of this story too. Uh, a lot of them are migrants to the ports to get engaged in this business. Uh, so, so lowly social origins, movement, that sort of ties them together. And the other is, a, is fierce ambition. If you want to know why people engage in the slave trade, which was one of my questions, it's what animates this book, there has to be something that animates it because there's lots of other trades out there they could be participating in. And the answer is they see the slave trade as a route to, to hoist themselves up in society, to make their fortune quickly. And so they're incredibly ambitious and incredibly ruthless as well. Their ambition to make so many of themselves fast is what makes them also incredibly violent and incredibly free of compunctions and willing to do the horrid things that we see uh, that are inherent to slave trading. Um, the, the sheer violence of it um, is connected to their lowly social origins. That is just so amazing. So I want to ask you, like, what was the slave trade like in pre-18th century? 
Yeah, so this is the point I start the, start the book with, is if you look at Britain's slave trade at the beginning of the 17th century, let's say, it is effectively non-existent. There is no British slave trade, really. Uh, if you look around 1700, uh, well, actually, just a little bit before that, it's certainly grown, and it's grown very large, and that's because of the growth of the places like Barbados as a sugar plantation colony, and to a lesser extent, the growth of places like Virginia as a tobacco colony that will be importing increasing numbers of um, enslaved people. Uh, likewise, there's growth in Africa, where you see places like modern-day Ghana take off as major areas where people are taken from, and in London, where the trade is principally organized. So there is a slave trade in the 17th century, Britain's slave trade. It is a large one. Uh, and, it, and it involves the enslavement of almost half a million people. So it's not insignificant, and it's important to know that. And that half a million people, remember that, each one of those uh, people is a man, woman, and child who face the horrors of enslavement. This isn't just bare statistics. But if you look at the, what the slave trade looks like afterwards, that's when you start to see why this trade is small, because uh, it would explode and become so large. I'll talk about that soon. Um, what you see in the 17th century is the trade concentrated entirely in London. Uh, all the ships go out of London with, it, with, with almost no exceptions. Being organized by joint stock trading companies that have shareholders, and most of those shareholders will be in the southeast of England as well. Uh, the captives who will be putting on board of the vessels from those companies will go from only a relatively small number of locations in Africa, and they'll be taken to a, an even smaller number of locations in the Americas as I said before, principally Barbados. So it's a trade that is um, geographically constricted um, in Africa, Britain, and the Americas. It involves relatively few enslaved people being dragged into it. And obviously, that needs to be a tap of caveat, as I said before. And um, involves investors who are, who are taking out in shares and in, the, in these companies and not fitting out slave ships. Um, so it's a it's an important business, but it's one that's quite constricted in size. Wow! And then, so if you're thinking about the changes, what happens? How is it transformed by the time we get to the 18th century? Well, what we see in the 18th century is that trade that I mentioned described just now before 1700, which is really concentrated in London, particular parts of Africa, and then to Barbados, just explodes in size. It goes from a trade in which just under half a million people will be enslaved to one in which over almost three million people will be enslaved in the 18th century, right? So it, so it massively expands. I think I say in the introduction to my book, they ship as many people off as Britons do in the, uh, in the 20 years leading up to abolition in 1807 as they do across the entire 18th century, uh, 17th century. That's the, the magnitude of this transformation. So if you just think of it in, in the sheer numbers of victims, it, it's bracing the transformation. And again, it's really important to emphasize that, and it's easy to lose sight of this, but when I start talking about almost 3 million people, it's almost unfathomable to think that each one of those was a person who each had an individual life story and an individual experience within the trade uh, and was, was one of its victims. Um, the sheer scale of sort of human misery caused by that expansion is really breathtaking um if we look at the where the trade is it changes entirely so in the 17th century it was all out of london here in britain it shifts uh out to little ports elsewhere in the country principally to bristol and then liverpool and liverpool will be the major slave trade port in the 18th century but it also goes to places like lancaster where i live whitehaven and all these little ports around the coast so it really migrates out and, and spreads across the country and that's the story we see too in africa uh, in the 18th, in the 17th century, sorry, most captives were taken off from a pretty narrow band of coasts centered around Monday, Ghana, and Benin. Uh, during the 18th century, Britons will carry off captives from ports stretched across 3,000 miles of coastline, and they'll take them to ports in the Americas that stretch from Boston all the way to Buenos Aires and everywhere in between. So what we're really seeing is the creation of a truly Atlantic-wide slave trade. Uh, by British merchants in collaboration with African merchants and American merchants. And that, too, will transform the wider slave trade, the slave trade as a whole. That will what make it a truly Atlantic-wide system. It will be this transformation that happens within Britain's slave trade. Now, as all of this is happening in terms of 
the slave traders themselves. I'm sure there's going to be, as you referenced earlier, some changes as to who is going to become involved. And, you know, there's going to be this new group of traders who are coming into power. Can you speak a little bit about that? Absolutely. So if you look at who organizes the slave trade in Britain here, uh, in Britain, sorry, uh, during the 17th century, it's principally companies like the Royal African Company. So the way that works is that the, the Crown charters this company, um, it's Crown Charter, it's got the support of the Crown, and actually what a lot of the shareholders, one of the major shareholders will be members of the, of the Royal Household. Uh, and that will have employees, directors, people who organize the shipping, people who are hired as captains, uh, and that will be financed by shareholders. And those shareholders can be either, as I say, members of the royal family or the aristocracy, but also common people in the street. So the actual sort of business of enslaving is left to employees of the company, whereas the financing is left to the people who um, who, who hold the shares. They're just return, expecting return on investment. We see a complete change in the 18th century. The way the slave trade is organized in the 18th century is partnerships, little groups of merchants, maybe two, three, sometimes maybe six or seven, will clump together, put in capital, buy a ship, outfit it together and ship and send it out to Africa. And so they'll be very hands-on in organizing that voyage. And so those hundreds of voyages, uh, over 100 voyages a year we see go out from Britain in the 18th century, and thousands across the 18th century, are organized by these little groups of merchants working together. So it's a completely different model. But that is the dominant model that really drives the slave trade's expansion. Uh, and so the backgrounds of the people involved in the trade here in Britain changes entirely. We shift from employees of a joint stock charter company supported by shareholders to private merchants who, um, who are engaged in the business of slaving uh, and might have themselves experience in that trade. So a lot of people who work as slave ship captains, uh, captains of the slave ships, then become merchants outfitting those slave ships. Um, likewise, we have merchants who are, might be, as I say, sons of brewers or farmers or something like that, uh, putting their money in and becoming very well, uh, very engaged in the business of slave trade. Um, so it's a completely new sort of breed of merchants, both in terms of where they are and who they are. They're no longer in London, they're out in places like uh, rural Lancashire, uh, rural Somerset down near Bristol, uh, rather than these Londoners. We see something similar happen in, in Africa. Um, in the 17th century, a lot of the, the slave trades organized on the same foundations as the trade in things like uh, gold, which is channeled through um, forts that are built on the coast of Africa um, and then shipped off. And the same people who will be trading gold will shift into trading slaves. And those will usually be the, the sort of merchant elites on the coast. What we see in the 18th century is a shift and the growth of entirely new slaving ports in Africa, entirely new locations, uh, with entirely new people being involved, in much the same way we see that trade migrate out of London into ports uh, in Britain. So to give you one example, Boni, which is a port in what's now Bondi, Nigeria, um, is very, very marginally engaged in the slave trade during the 17th century, and it becomes the largest slave trading port in the 18th by the end of the 18th century. It's transformed in the space of about 50 years. And so the, the merchants who are buying and selling people there, the African merchants, are newcomers to the trade in the same way as people, say, in Liverpool or in Bristol. Uh, people, again, who are trying to bolt themselves up the social ladder through the slave trade. Uh, so there is enormous changes in, in who is engaged in the slave trade in this period, just as there are changes in where it is and how it is conducted. Wow. So you're, as you're going from the 17th to 18th century, there are some major transformations that are taking place during this period. So as you alluded to earlier, as you're talking about the merchants, you know, in Britain, Africa and the Americas, they are in some way similar and they're also very different um, as they're coming into this business. So I want to ask you, how profitable was the slave trade? That's a great question. And it's the one that has really animated my research now since going since I really began this strand all the way back in to like 2008 when I started looking at 
that guy William Davenport for the first time. You know, one of the things that really, really motivated me to explore his business was to say, well, how profitable was it to him? And, and if it was profitable, how much money did he make? And where did he put that money? And that, I've, I've carried that forward with me as I've looked at other groups of merchants. And really, this is a question I keep turning over and over. Uh, because the profitability of the slave trade is sort of crucial to understanding the importance of that trade for you know, shaping the modern world. Because if it was incredibly profitable, then it would follow that a lot of money flowed out of that trade into other areas of the economy. And we would see legacies of that around us today. And indeed, in the past, you know, it's also important for shaping, say, the world of the 18th century and things like building and shipping country houses and all the ways that people can invest money in the past. So to return to, it, to your question and give you a clear answer, the answer is that the slave trade is generally profitable. If you look, uh, average returns for people who are, say, um, outfitting slave ships here in Britain will be about 10% per annum, which might not sound like a lot, but that means that investors will double their money probably, every, you know, roughly every seven years or so. And that's a much greater return than you would find in a lot of other investments. So the slave trade is profitable. It's important to know that. However, if you drill down and look at slave trade and businesses, look at their accounts and look at what the business actually entails, as I've done, what you actually see is it's incredibly risky. And it's risky because slave traders trade people, right? They're not shipping just commodities and goods. They're shipping people. That's their business. And people fight back. People resist. People fall sick. They perish on the voyage. And, and that, to the slave traders, affects their profitability because it reduces the amount of money they can make. And so, and added to that, the slave trade also involves sending ships out on some of the longest voyages in, in the early modern world because the ships have to go around the Atlantic out to Africa from Britain then across the Americas, then back again. So they could be out for as long as a year with all the perils of the sea that entails. So what you see is, okay, in, an ag in aggregate, slave traders might be earning something like 10% per annum, and that's true also of the people who sell the slaves in the Americas, by the way. But the sort of year-to-year -year returns fluctuate wildly from returns of as much as 100% where they double their money on a single voyage to catastrophic losses where people are wiped out and driven into bankruptcy. And so... A lot of the slave traders go into the business expecting to make their fortune and actually face ruin, uh, financial ruin, and go into bankruptcy. Others um, win big and bolt up the social ladder incredibly quickly. Uh, true rag to riches stories you see about some of these people. And once you understand that, this isn't just sort of narrow business history uh, that I'm trying to emphasize here about, you know, quantitative studies of profits. But that does tell you something about the types of people who engage in this business and why, right? They're people who are incredibly risk tolerant, an economist would say, but they're also people who are people who are seeking their fortune because they think that this, this trade is something that can generate very quick returns, albeit always tempered with the, with the um, risk of bankruptcy and ruin. Which that's always an option because you are, you know, there's huge, there are they are selling human. So there's a lot of risk factors and things that outside of their control that can go into that. So I want to ask you, how were the slave tra trade network, what were the ones that developed? How did they develop? Yeah, one of the, one of the fascinating things of studying this trade is you realize that this is a trade that's fundamentally premised on breaking up bonds between people. That's what slave trading entails because you might take an entire village of people into captivity, and then the slave traders will pull those people apart to shunt them to different parts of the coast in Africa, put them on different vessels, take them to different locations. Once they get there, they might separate people and be on the ships together. So this is fundamentally a business that's premised on breaking up people who speak the same language, who have family connections, friendships, everything. You know, that's, that's what happens to the enslaved. That's the horrors of it. But for the slave traders, it's a business in which personal relationships uh, it's fundamental to actually developing personal relationships and personal ties. That applies here if you look at how slave traders operate in Britain because they operate in these little partnerships where they're all putting in money and investing in individual ships. And so they have bonds that are secured by a um, family, often marriage, um, 
shared religion, shared origins in different villages, shared attendance to congregations of particular churches, and so on and so forth. But then connections to between slave traders in different zones is also crucial as well. So um, slave traders in Africa develop particular ties with slave traders in Britain, and they secure those ties by, in some cases, writing letters back and forth. Some of them learn to write. They come to, they send their children to places like Liverpool to be schooled in how to, how to read and write. And then when they go back to Africa, they can maintain a correspondence with the, with the parts in, in Britain. Uh, but also by sending gifts to each other, that can be things like ivory tusks uh, inscribed with the names of particular people, but also things like gifts of enslaved children who will be sent to Britain to work in the households of particular slave, slave, slaving merchants. Um, ties between slave traders in America and Britain are also really important. So one of the things I explore in the book is when the ships get to the Americas, how do they know, the captains of the ships, how do they know which colony to go to? Because remember, Britain's American um, empire by the late 18th century has, you know, a two dozen different colonies, all of them are a potential slave market. And the answer is British merchants um, partner with slave trading merchants in the Americas, uh, either through friendship or because they've sent a relative over there to set up a, a, a firm or through marriage again or through shared uh, religious affinity again. There's all these ways that there's sort of social ties between these slave trading merchants. And that is fundamental to business because it reduces the risk of the business. And as I've mentioned in my answer about profitability, risk is so high in the slave trade that slave traders are always trying to reduce it in any way they can. Uh, and networks is one way to do that. Wow, that is just amazing that they actually have just like external ties besides business ties that link them together. So I want to hone in on the African slave trade. How were, what happens in the African slave trade? How are the slaves gotten? Um, and what happens to them? Well, that's fundamental to understanding why the Britain slave trade explodes in size because the, the cap for this trade to reach such enormous proportions where almost 3 million people will be carried off from Africa in the 18th century, those people have to be made into captives. Those people have to be enslaved, okay? So one of the questions of the book is how does that process work in Africa, in the interior, away from the coast, away from where the ships are? Uh, and, and the obvious answer is no matter where you look, violence is fundamental to this to this process because no one wants to be a slave they have to be forced into captivity so there has to be some sort of violent process that forces people into into the slave trade either in, in interior in africa or you know, an, an interior african slave trade and then out to the to the transatlantic slave trade too um but actually if you look at uh different african areas of the african coast where the slave trade is, really takes off during the 18th century you see quite a lot of change and a lot of difference so I'll give you two examples from uh, the two major areas of Africa where most of the captains go into Britain's slave trade and draw from. And that's the so-called Gold Coast, which is modern-day Ghana, and the Baita Biafra, which is modern-day Nigeria. So if you look at the if you look at modern-day Ghana, uh, Gold Coast, what you see is in the interior <laughs> is new um, empires, kingdoms arise, which are um, really sort of slaving kingdoms, slaving empires, that focus on expansionary warfare and that they, 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 they are driven by the acquisition of captives. And, and those empires are able to emerge because they're armed via first the gold trade and then the slave trade with imported firearms, muskets and gunpowder brought from Britain. Um, and so conquest is really important in driving the massive expansion of the slave trade you know, on the Gold Coast. And most of the people who will be funneled, therefore, down to the coast will have probably been seen their village conquered, their kingdom conquered, uh, and then been rounded up afterward after a, a battle and marched off. We see that in the slave narratives, actually. So warfare is fundamental there. And that's true of other areas of the coast, too, like Baita Benin, which is to the east, or Senegambia, which is further to the north, near the desert. If you look in the Baita Biafra, though, Monday Nigeria, you see something very different. No uh, new kingdom emerges, no new slaving state focused on 
firearms or expansionary wars or anything of that, of that kind that we see on the Gold Coast. Instead, we see a trading diaspora called the Arrow spread out through the densely populated hinterland and set up little trading posts, and colonies, uh, and through those, they acquire people from the nearby villages, typically by purchase from the villagers. And those people will have been enslaved usually through the corruption of legal codes. So uh, in the village, if someone's um, deemed to have committed a crime, but their condemnation will often be to be sold into slavery to the Arrow. Uh, other people will be kidnapped uh, uh, on wary travellers on the road or snatched out of their back gardens, like the famous per uh, captive Orlando uh, Equiano. Uh, and, and, and the collective result of all those little individual actions is that tens of thousands of people are marched down to the coast every year. But again, this isn't through conquest. This is through this trading diaspora and the acquisition of people uh, through this trading diaspora. So... It's, it's sort of regional specific how um, the slaves are acquired, how someone becomes a slave. And therefore, it's difficult to make a sweeping generalization beyond the fact that violence does indeed underpin the acquisition of people wherever you, wherever you look. Violence, as you say, it remains, you know, at the center of how all this takes place. So I want to ask you as to who is being enslaved, how important were demographics? Um, of the enslaved population and the slave trade? Who were they looking to obtain, and did that change? Well, again, th this is fundamentally important to how the slave trade, both in Africa and then indeed the transatlantic slave trade, operates. And I'll, I'll confine my, my reply for now to the, how it operates in the African slave trade, because I think this illustrates it really well. And, and so in, in most areas of the African coast, and this is a this is a bit of a generalization. You know, things like agriculture and domestic service are usually carried out by um, by women. And therefore, African slaveholders typically retain large numbers of women uh, as, as, as captains, as, as prisoners within within Africa, and ship off the men. Uh, so if you look at somewhere like uh, the, the Gold Coast, as they say, or other areas of the coast nearby, about two-thirds of the people being taken down to the coast and sold to Europeans will be met. However, again, there are regional differences. So if we go back to that area I mentioned before, the Bight of Biafra, that's an unusual place. And the reason is um, yam agriculture in the interior um, um, of the Bight of Biafra is actually a male pursuit. Yams are the staple crop of the region. And so women are less required by African slaveholders there um, to perform agriculture. And so we actually see significantly larger numbers of enslaved women being taken to the coast and sold to Europeans there than we do elsewhere on the coast, whereas the same men typically predominate. So in general, the slave trade um, in Africa is one in which women are retained and men are shipped off, but there are regional differences. It's important to recognize those and understand that those will shape the identities of people going to the coast and indeed, the experiences of the people being moved through the trade. Um, you know, fundamentally, who goes into one, takes one route into slavery, and who takes another? Uh, where will people end up living the rest of their lives? You know, this, that's what we're fundamentally talking about. Well, one of the things I've really enjoyed in your book, even though it was, you know, it's a very hard topic to digest just on the human side of things, is you talk about the slaves who are not put on the ships. Can you speak about this? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, one of the challenges of studying this, the transatlantic slave trade, which is fundamentally a story of those people who were taken onto the ships and shipped off, is trying to work out what happens to those who were not. Um, and it's important to remember that, you know, an enormous number of people are not shipped onto the, and uh, pushed into the transatlantic slave trade and taken away on the vessels. Because, as I've mentioned before, African slaveholders will retain people there and people will live out the remainder of their lives as an enslaved person in Africa. Uh, perhaps um, working in agriculture, raising crops there, perhaps working as a domestic servant uh, within the household of an of a African slaveholder. Or if we go down to the coast, for example, working as a canoeman in the vessels that ply back and forth between the shore and the ships, carrying enslaved people to them. Those are typically manned by slaves. There's lots of different roles for enslaved people in, in Africa, and therefore enormous numbers of people are kept there. But if we shift our attention to the transatlantic slave trade and that interface between the African and transatlantic slave trade on the coast, when we see Europeans in their vessels purchasing people, we see there as well 
um, people who are not put aboard the vessel to be sent back ashore. So what I talk about in the book is when the captives are brought down to the coast, the European captains captains will inspect them to to pull out the people they think are healthy enough to survive the voyage and old enough to work in the Americas. Um, and that leaves behind a lot of people who are either too young, too, too sickly, or too old, according to the purchasing criteria of the Europeans. And those people, at least according to witnesses, are sometimes beaten by the, the African brokers on the coast. Although that's the case, I don't know. That's just how it's reported. Uh, but my suspicion is actually a lot of them are returned ashore and either then tried to be resold to another captain, another European on the coast. Um, and so we see a lot of these people having to endure multiple some moments of inspection and potential sale. And eventually people being, um, being sent back ashore and then perhaps marched back into the interior. So it's a long-winded way of saying that it, there's definitely a sort of gravitational pull of captives onto the ships but it's not always one way and a lot of people do go back ashore and do go back into the interior and do remain in uh, africa as slaves even if they may have had that traumatic uh, encounter with the slave ships during their lives that's just so fascinating to think about and so i want to ask you you know we are going to the ship. So you have these enslaved Africans now who have been pulled from their lives that they were in and they're taken to these ships. What was that like? You know, I have a vignette in the end of the, one of my chapters on this that I stumbled on when I was just going through the letters of um, these um, slave traders who, who uh, work in the fort in modern day Ghana, what's now modern day Ghana, and they're writing back and forth to each other about their, their business. And one of them describes acquiring an enslaved woman and her child. She's always a baby with her. And she's rowed along the coast in a, in a long boat, probably by a European crewman, having been sold to the slave ship. And, and the officer on the ship says that when she gets to the vessel, she immediately, and is brought aboard, she immediately goes out of her senses. And no matter what they do, they can't seem to sort of get through to her and so they actually send her back ashore and say this person has gone mad and, and the guy who is reporting this who lives on the coast um, just writes well this is this often happens and what you see there is that is the sheer terror and horror of these people who are brought into this alien environment this this these vessels which look completely different than anything that um, especially those people who live inland would have seen surrounded by the boundless ocean and inhabited by people who also look radically different to what enslaved Africans are used to. That is to say, these are white Europeans with, you know, different colored hair, speaking a peculiar language, wearing peculiar clothes, uh, who are very violent, probably shouting and barking orders, uh, and surrounded by um, hundreds of captains aboard the vessel who are chained and, and miserable. Um, so you can imagine it, it, it would be an experience akin in some ways to being abducted by aliens and brought into this strange world. And you can, so you can see why it would drive some people completely out of their senses. Um, if your listeners are interested in this topic, um, I, I explored a bit in my book, but um, um, Stephanie Smallwood has a whole chapter on this in her wonderful book, Saltwater Slavery, which explores that sort of mental world of slave trade for the enslaved and, and, the, and the sort of horrid transition into this world. Um, so that deals with the mental aspects of it. Um, but if we turn to the, the sort of physical effects of being brought on the ships, it, it, it is horrid in the extreme. One thing that I've found by researching these vessels is the degree to which people are crowded aboard them. This is a vessel that might be 100 feet long and about 25 feet wide at its widest point, these ships, and they'll have something like 300 people crammed aboard them. And so the people on the vessels, they just don't, they have barely have room to move. If you think of a sort of crowded subway car, that's the sort of level of crowding we see above decks on the vessel. Uh, and then people will be, will be squeezed next to each other below deck. And so the physical effects of the voyage are, are really terrible on the, on the enslaved. I mean, people waste away, they, they, they die of um, thirst, 
they die of any transmissible disease. You can think of the violence of the crewmen, despair, of course. Um, and so, so um, something like one in five of the embarked people who go on the ships will not make it to the other side uh, and will perish on the way. Uh, but I can say more as you as we go through. Well, you know, it's interesting. I was as I was reading, I noticed that you use um, Marcus Redeker's term "floating dungeon" to describe the ship. Um, can you explain why that was? Yeah, that's a <clears throat> that's a term that um, Redeker describes in his seminal book, "The Slave Ship: A Human History," where he tried to he's drawing on a, actually an account of a sailor who served on a slave ship, and that's the term he describes him. Um, Redeker uses that to really good effect to describe what is a slave ship. And as he as he insightfully points out, it's really a floating prison, a floating dungeon. It's a it's a, a prison for three hundred people that's designed to drag them to the other side. And so that was a useful way of thinking about these spaces when I was trying to examine slave ships myself. But also to think about, and that's be, and that's because of the the um the sort of security apparatus that are that are on these vessels. So if your listeners think of a what we would often sort of call a pirate ship, right, a, a, a sailing ship of the 18th century, it's got three masts uh, and it's got decks, right, a, a sort of deck above, which is open to the air, a deck below, which is about five or six feet high, and then the holes in the vessel. And the slave traders used the fact to sort of redesign that space to turn these vessels into basically prisons so the captives can, the Africans can either capture or take over. Or, uh, or or escape from. So across the middle of the deck at the top is what's called a barricado, and that's a nine or ten foot high smooth wooden wall that bisects the, the ship in two. And so the African men will be imprisoned on one side of that wall and the women behind it, where the, most of the crew will be. All around the net will be what's called quarter netting, which is just a, a, a sort of net that's um, strung all the way around it. And that's like a cage that keeps the people in so they can't leap over the side and escape or even hurl themselves to their deaths in the sea. And then below deck, the, um, the space below, that room that's you know, an area sort of five or six feet high, that's divided up by walls as well to separate enslaved people from each other. And then um, shackles and chains are used as well. So male slaves will be shackled usually uh, in handcuffs and then often sort of leg cuffs which binds them to another another person for the entirety of the time they're on the ship, from literally the moment they go on the vessel to literally the moment they're sold, which might be something like six, seven, or eight months. And then there are even long chains they put down the middle of the deck into which people are attached as well, so they can't even move from the spot. Um, add to that the fact that these are vessels with maybe 40 sailors, and those sailors are effectively guards because they'll be armed with hand-to-hand -hand weapons, but also things like pistols, and muskets as well. And you suddenly start to understand why that term floating dungeon is so apt. It's because this is effectively a prison, one which is incredibly hard to break out of or to capture. That just sounds so horrific and so barbaric as you're thinking about this experience. So for my listeners, I want you to explain, like, what was the day like? for these captives on the boat? That's a good question. It's one that's actually relatively easy to answer, and that's because the slave traders design a strict daily routine on their vessels. And this is a routine that carries on pretty much every vessel that operates in the slave trade during the 18th century. So, you know, 10, over 10,000 ships go out in the 18th century. Uh, sorry, across the history of the slave trade. And most of them will be using this daily routine. And that is... The captives will be brought up above deck around pretty much whenever the sun comes up, which is usually around 8 a.m., right? So there'll be hatches will be flung open, and the captives will be brought up from below deck. That's where they will be overnight. Okay, the men going up onto the main deck at the front, women and children going up into the back. And there, they will be met with the guards who will check the shackles of the men uh, and sort of lock them into chains. And the women will be allowed to relatively, relative liberty at the back. I mean, they won't be, they won't be chained. Shortly thereafter, um, they'll be the captives will be fed, and that's usually with uh, these sort of big buckets of um, food, which are usually some kind of um, 
starch that's been cooked down into a sort of sloppy porridge. So that could be rice, corn, grits, that kind of food, uh, yams, um, potatoes, flour, anything that could really be cooked down into a easily digestible, what we say, I guess, with slop. So the captives are forced to eat that. You know, anyone who doesn't eat that food is beaten. The, the food is then cleared away. They have a small glass of water, maybe half a pint. And then the crewmen force them to what's called in the trade, dance. Now that is a misnomer, if ever there was one, because it's really forcing the captive to move around to exercise their limbs. They'd lie then, this is about 10 a.m., long wait period where the, the captives are just sat on the deck. Or, okay, the women have to move around a little bit can in the crowd and then a so-called dinner is served in which uh, they have another similar meal followed by another spell of enforced dancing by now which is about 6 p.m sun will be starting to dip below the horizon it tends to go very down very fast near the equator and so the crewmen will force the captives down below deck once they go below they're forced into uh, to lie themselves down uh, in the below deck space and down there will be truly horrid. And the reason is the amount of space that each person is allocated is horrendously small. So for an enslaved man, it might be like six feet uh, lengthways and about 14 inches across, a woman about five and a half feet and about 12 inches across. So if you look at the surviving images of what these areas below deck looks like, the men would actually be pressed up against their neighbors on their side. That's how little room they have. And they'll be stuck down there from about 6 p.m. till about 8 a.m. the next day. So that's about 16 hours are in these states. In these conditions. Uh, and you can imagine with two or 100 people in these enclosed rooms in the tropics, the heat of those areas will be horrendous. It will be like a steam room, you know, over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And so the sweat will be pouring off the captives who are in these uh, and obviously, there's other, you know, these are people who have to use things like use the bathroom, and there'll be sort of big tubs that are placed down that they all have to use, and those would fill up fast and then overspill. You'd have people who were sick or seasick or have um, diarrhea with disastrous effects that would all spread disease. Was, so you, you can't really imagine a worse situation that people are in. And this is the conditions on the vessel every day for the uh, or about 10 weeks, 9 to 10 weeks it takes for these ships to go across from Africa to the Americas. I can't even imagine just being in that environment and having to survive, but many of the captives actually do. So what I wanted to ask you was the slave traders, they are businessmen. So how do they seek to reduce mortality on the ships? Yeah, so the first thing to know is that they are, the slave traders are very well aware of the conditions that on their vessels. They, they have no illusion about it. And the reason is because they create those conditions. They decide how many people they want to put on the ships. They decide how much cargo they want to send out to Africa to be converted, traded for people. And they actually pay out when they're in Britain for the amount of space they're going to allocate to each person. They measure it out and then, you know, with a tape measure and to think, okay, do we think these people need X amount of space or Y amount of space? And likewise, in addition to being knowledgeable about these conditions, they're knowledgeable about the fact that a lot of the people they, they buy are going to perish on the voyage because they're going to be in these hellish conditions. Um, so they have no illusions about what the business they're in, and they have no illusions about the experience of the Africans they're going to purchase and the horrors they're going to experience. And, and the... Um, and the the dire effects that it'll have on their health and the fact that it'll probably kill about, in the 17th century, somewhere around one in four of everyone that's put on the vessel. But, as you said in your question, they're also businessmen. And so they realize that if they are able to get more people to the Americas alive, they will increase their profits. And so they have a vested interest in reducing the number of people who perish on the vessels who die at sea in these conditions. Now, I want to make it clear, though, that that's not driven by any kind of humanitarianism, by any kind of concern for people's welfare, by any kind of concern that they're shipping people and that people deserve sympathy or care or anything like that. This is pure uh, business, because that's the, the mindset of these trading men. That's how they all are. 
but they do nonetheless have this idea that they need to reduce mortality and boost their own their own earnings. And they do so by instituting that daily routine I've just talked about. Now that routine, as I've just explained, is hellish in the extreme. There's no doubt about it. There's nothing pleasant about it. There's nothing redeeming about it. But if you compare it to the conditions that prevailed in the slave trade before 1700, there are important differences. And the first is that before 1700, <clears throat> it was rare for people to be brought up on deck at all. They would be forced below deck in the ships, uh, at least not for the entire day. They'd be forced below deck uh, when they departed from Africa, locked down there, and they might only come out once a day in small groups to use the bathroom and to eat a small amount of food before they were locked down below. So unbelievable as it is, and and, and and sort of boggling to the mind. Millions of enslaved people experienced being dragged across the ocean, pretty much sealed into these vessels, uh, and, and rarely saw daylight, rarely had any fresh air, and rarely had anything to eat, uh, with all the horrors that would entail on people's health. So that daily routine I've just described is really an invention of the late 17th and early 18th century as they're transforming the trade, as they're expanding it, and as they're thinking, how can we bring down mortality on the vessels to boost our profits? Because what they realize is bring the captives above deck during the day and keep them up there for even for just eight hours. That means you can provide them more food, more water. You can clean out the below deck space. It would be absolutely horrid. You can imagine of having 300 people trapped down there. So they scrape all that out and wash it sometimes with vinegar and things. Um, it does allow the captives to at least move their bodies somewhat through that horrid force dancing. None of this, though, I want to point out, is, makes the voyage pleasant for the people. It's not, it's not what's intended. It, it's all designed as an instrument to marginally reduce the impact on people's health and therefore increase the number of people who make it to the other side and can be then sold into slavery for a profit. It, it, you know, it sounds so barbaric and so horrific when you think about this and think about what occurred and that this was, but for slave traders and the merchants that you're talking about, this is business. Um, there's not that human factor that's in their mind. This is for profit. And so they're trying to maximize profits as they are doing these things. But at its core, it is barbaric to say the least so if you're able to survive this horrific voyage as you're crossing what happens once you get to let's say a destination how does the slave sales actually occur what is that experience like well one thing i'd like to note before we get on to how people are sold is something i had to explore um prior to that and and that's because we've, we've always had this assumption that the slave ships leave africa there's this hellish little passage truly hellish as i've just described but it has a very clear end and that's when the ship reaches land when it gets to somewhere like virginia or barbados or south carolina or jamaica that's the moment when the ship drops anchor and the captives are released from their chains and sold and i'll, I'll talk about what that looks like in a minute but one thing to keep in mind is if you don't your listeners open Google Earth or Google Maps or any of these atlases and look at how the Americas, um, the, the geography of the Americas, you'll see it's very, very large. And if you look at Barbados, which is about is sort of out to the east, uh, the sort of eastern point of where the glaciers come in, and then look to somewhere like Jamaica or especially somewhere like South Carolina or Virginia, look at the distances between those places. You're talking a, a thousand or two thousand miles between them. So the arrival of the ships in the Americas, uh, first arrival of the Americas, say, let's say the ship touches in Barbados, it puts down its anchor, the slaves are on the deck, they look out at what they think is their salvation, reaching land, you can finally get off its awful vessel. What I show is that that's not the case. Uh, and that's because these ships are going to up anchor again and head on to another location. And so the ships might tack between different islands, they might go up, through all through the Caribbean islands, up through the Bahamas to get up somewhere like South Carolina or up to Virginia. That can take as long as a month, an extra month of, of being trapped on these vessels. And they can see the land, they can see the shore, they can see the people and the other ships. And they're still experiencing the, this daily routine that I've talked about. 
Uh, and so there's, there's this sort of extra stage to the voyage that precedes sail that's really important, I think. Really important because it means that people who, let's say, if all the ships just dropped anchor in Barbados and let their people, captives off the vessel, you know, there'd be a lot of people on those ships who would, who would survive, who would make it live to the slavery. But because they go on these extra voyages, a lot of them perish uh, because the slave trader's interest is in dragging them to somewhere where they'll think they make more money by selling them. Uh, and that's just not an aspect of the slave trader that I think has been explored nearly enough or, or indeed at all by, by uh, other scholars looking at this, uh, looking at this trade. Um, the other aspect of that voyage that I think is really important is we're no longer talking about ships that are out in the Atlantic Ocean and the captives when they're up on the deck looking out, all they see is the ocean and the sea and wondering where on earth are we going? When will this nightmare end? Because you know, all they see is the boundless ocean. Suddenly they're in an area where they can see um, towns, people, and people come and go from the vessels when they're anchored, you know, and a lot of those will be enslaved and they'll talk to them. Uh, other vessels, they'll see plantations. So in Virginia, for example, the ships go up rivers so they can see the plantations off either side of the river of the, of the ship with people working on them. So this is actually a time where the slaves sort of get a clear sense of, okay, well, this is where we, we, we've been dragged to and this is what the fate that's going to await us. So there's this really important sort of phase to the voyage where a lot of people are able to start to work out what will be my destiny, what will be my fate, what awaits me out the other side. Which they wouldn't have known a lot of them while they were on the, at, at sea. They were sort of left puzzled as to what, where they're going and how long this will take. Okay, now you had a question for me. That was a long I'm well, sorry. wait, pause there, Dr. Rapp, for just, I'm mentally conceptualizing this, you know, like being on the ship and you're seeing out, you know, because you've gotten past all the war and you could actually see things, um, but yet you're still trapped on this ship. I can't imagine like the mental anguish for the captives that they endured along everything else that they had to deal with. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that um, I come back to that that work by um, Stephanie Smallwood, because she does such a good job of, of exploring this, the ways in which the captives on the ship, you know, they don't know what awaits them out the other side. They don't know how long this voyage is going to take. For all they know, they're going to be on the, on the vessel forever, carried along by these strange otherworldly beings, perhaps to be eaten by them. That's often what they think of it, the whites are pining them to eat them. Um... And I always, whenever I teach this aspect of the slave trade to my students, so we use primary sources where slaves are talking about their experience on the ship and they talk about this, I often say to them, you know, it's hard to think of this, but in some ways that would be equally as tough as the sort of physical anguish of the voice, physical travails, the not knowing, the confusion, the, the sort of mental um, overload of being in this, in this space, but also the anguish of thinking this might just go on forever. I mean, it, it, it sort of beggars belief. Um, that you could that you could be trapped on a vessel in these sort of hellish conditions and not know that it's finite and not know the fate that awaits you on the other side. Um, but it's important to recognize that because that was the experience of these millions of people who were trapped in the slave trade. It is just, it seems like it's just a hellish experience all around, even before you, from start to finish, there's no, you know, the torment that the captives had to go through and some of which I, it's just, it's hard to conceptualize it because it doesn't seem like it real, yet it was. But it comes back to this was a business. Uh, the humans, unfortunately, were the commodities um, that were being sold during this period in time. So let's dive into those unfortunate sales, which in your book, it paints just another horrific picture of what occurs um, for them as they're actually going through the sale process. Yeah, this is another aspect of the slave trade that I think hasn't received as nearly as much attention as it deserves. There has been some wonderful work on it. Again, um, Steffi Smallwood's book does a good job of exploring this, and, and Sawanda Muskeen's uh, excellent book as well, um, Slavery at Sea, explores slave sales too. But, but really, you know, if you compare the amount of ink that's been spilled on the Middle Passage, that voyage from Africa to the Americas that I've talked about, to how much has been written on what happens to enslaved people when they reach the Americas and are sold, it, it, it's, there's a huge disparity. So I really wanted to go some way to correcting that by exploring these sales in my book and say, 
what do these sales look like? How are people sold when they get to the Americas? What does that process look like? And what's the experience like for the people who have to endure it? And what I basically show is that these sales are much more drawn out than you might expect. I, our sort of typical view of a slave sale is really dominated by our idea of the antebellum U.S. South, that is, you know, the auction block, the sort of typical auction block of the U.S. South. But that's not how these sales occur in the Americas, uh, in, in the era of the slave trade. Uh, instead, what happens is the ships come into the harbor, uh, an advertisement is placed in the local newspaper, and they actually put posters around town as well to advertise it, to tell all the buyers who want potential buyers to come down and there's a, a slave sale about start. There's a day in which the sale is meant to begin, usually I think about 10 a.m. And so the, the buyers flock down to the ship, and at the preordained time, there's an announcement made, they might fire off a little cannon or hit a drum or shout, the sails open, and they fling open either the gates of the sail yard or pull a plank down to access the ship, and the buyers will flock aboard to buy the captain. Um, and that, what they'll do is they'll, the buyers will fan through the vessel, grabbing people they want to purchase, shoving aside those they don't, and drag them off and then say, okay, I want to negotiate the sail with the, with the American slave crew, and they, and they march to the shore take them back to their to their locations um and that process occur ha, continues day after day until every single person on the on the vessel is sold regardless of their health their age their gender whatever all of them are, are sold and, and the, the moment the last person sold to the ship that's the moment when the when the sale is announced to end now what i've found by looking at just an enormous number of um records of these sales is that process drags on for about three weeks uh, on average. And when you factor in that the vessel is sat in the harbor with the people on board for somewhere between one and two weeks, what you're looking at is that the, the sails take about half as long as the middle passage. So this is a significant period of time in the experience of the enslaved on the vessels. It's not, in, it's not you know, over a day, usually. It usually stretches on for a long time. Uh, however, as with it, other things in, in the trade, like I was talking about the profits, the sale lengths also fluctuate enormously. So some of them might go on for a month, two months, three months, etc. Uh, some of them might be concluded in as short as an hour, in which hordes of buyers just flock onto the vessel, and ru literally run aboard, grab it, and, and carry them off. Um, so there's huge variety in in the length of these sales, and that those are really going to shape. Uh, experience of the people on board. Can you can imagine these terrified Africans who don't really have a good sense of why they've been taken there, what this place is, getting seized by these colonial buyers and dragged off. Or in these longer sails, having to stand on the deck of a ship or in, a, in the yard of a colonial merchant for week after week while buyers come in and inspect them and shove them and, and, and uh, you know, pull them apart from their shipmates. Uh, you know, you can start to see why these are. I argue, really important moments for the enslaved who have to endure them. That, <clears throat> to think about after you have endured this horrific voyage, then you are going to be essentially going through a process whereby you are physically examined and not easily physically examined as you're waiting and waiting for someone to buy you. I just can't, you know, as an enslaved person, that just, that it boggles the mind. Um, that this actually occurred and it was fairly extensive that this was occurring on a regular basis and you know it's hard to say that this was business as usual um, during this period but it just seems like it's so hard to say that but it was business as usual. Oh. Yeah, and that's one of the points I want to argue that I argue in the book. I mean, I mean, this is the case with the other aspects of the trade I look at too, but how the ships operate, how people are sold in Africa, but it's the same with how people are sold in America. What the slave traders do is work out, this is how we're going to operate, right? This is how we're going to operate a slave sale in the Americas, for example. And then that is the method that's adopted across the Americas, be it in, with very, very few variations, be it in Barbados, or Jamaica, even though those places are separated by a thousand miles, be it in 1790 or 1730, even though they, 
distance of 60 years, um, they come up with these sort of standardized methods of, of trading and they replicate them across the Americas, across the African coast, across the slave ship fleet, um, and utilize them with very few variations. So that was, that was really striking. Um, and, and I'm glad, so I'm glad you sort of picked that up as, as you were reading and going through. Well, you know, it's interesting. And, you know, and it makes me wonder, you know, was there, you know, as you're looking at all of the traders across the different geographic regions, you know, did they only view the Africans as human? Did they only view them as, excuse me, commodities? Or was there a human factor that came into play? Was there any guilt, remorse, you know, distaste for what they were doing? Or was it just nothing? It was like, it's just an economic entity. I've seen very little evidence that they view their victims as anything but commodities. Very, very little. And the reason is this. Um, the, the standardized methods that I've just sort of sketched out you know, the idea that they would have a set process for selling people in Africa or a set process for selling people in America. Or that routine on the Middle Passage, that way of shipping people, all of them are premised on the idea that enslaved people are commodities, um, that they are people who can be forced into these horrid processes. There's, there's nothing inherent to those processes that I've described that ha makes any assumption about, say, people, the fact that people have ties to each other, the fact that people will have family members with each other, the fact that you're going to, if operating, say, a slave ship, that these methods will kill people or injure their health. There, there's none of that, um, except insofar as um, they make changes based on, you know, to increase profitability. But that's nothing to do with their concern for the welfare of enslaved people or their acknowledgement that they're shipping humans and that those people deserve sympathy and, and care and those kind of things. It's all just motivated by profit. Uh, and that's a shared mentality, unfortunately. Uh, you can see it in the diaries of slave traders and the letters, um, pretty much wherever you look. Um, I can recommend a book called The Diary of Antara Duke. That's a project I worked on when I was still in New Zealand as a, as a researcher. There's a diary of a um, African slave trader in Old Calabar, which is a port in what's now modern day Nigeria. And if you read his diary, you'll see that he um, he records his slave trading activities as if it's just a business, as if it's just his day to day activity that, that requires zero thought, zero compunction, zero um, reflection. And, and we see that too in uh, the records of slave traders in the Americas, slave traders in Britain. It's a shared mindset, and and it makes sense that that will be the case when you think that anyone who doesn't have that mindset, a wouldn't get into the slave trade, and b if they did, if they did get in the slave trade, uh, for whatever reason, will be very hard to stay in it because they will be they wouldn't be able to live with themselves. So the people who tend to stay in the trade and stick with it and carry on with the business have res have sort of resign themselves to the fact that this is what they do and that it's okay. And and that's that's deeply unpleasant to think about. But unfortunately it was the it was the truth. And that was the case with these people. I know, it's kinda it's horrific to think about as you say, but you know, as you have to shift your mindset because for them it wasn't about their humanity. They only saw them as commodities. They were profits. Uh not people with lives families, you know, connections, it was just they were commodities that were to be bought and sold. And that's just, you know, it seems as you're thinking about it, like, and you're saying it out loud right now, it just seems so hollow. And, but, and it's hard to even find the but there, because there is a but, you know, but they were people, but it was a different mindset um, that they had during this time and as you said for those to survive they had to shut that part of themselves off because they couldn't as you say you couldn't live with yourself if this is what you were doing you're maximizing profits at the expense of people's lives um you can't really reconcile that for the most part you can't 
justify it. So, you know, I want to ask you, Dr. Ratburn, what do you want readers to take away from the book? Well, the main thing I want the readers to take away is, you know, having spoken a, such a huge amount about the merchants, about the people, the sort of perpetrators, the enslavers, uh, the, in reading this book, it's actually a book that's largely about the enslaved, about their experiences. And, that's, and that was always what I set out to do, was to sort of try and understand the experience of the enslaved by understanding, the, you know, the mindsets and the and the actions of the people that enslaved them. And so there's a lot here that's about what it means to be enslaved and what that, and why pe so many people were carried off and what they endured and what they survived. Um, and so I really like the, the focus to be on them and not the, the individual's the abhorrent individuals who I who we've talked about at such length uh, today, who are nonetheless was crucially important for driving the transformation of the trade and for enslaving so many millions of people. Dr. Radborn, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Katrina. Readers, please go out and pick up a copy of Traders in Men. It is on now and I promise you will not regret it. It's one of those books that it's for academics. It's for non-academics. I urge you go out and pick up a copy of this book today.